very special comparative event. And we couldn't get more comparative than New Zealand and the UK. Um, on that, I'm, and I'll explain to Bill English, um, the audience um, has a number of uh, serving civil servants, people who monitor the behaviour of the civil service, and a few retired civil servants, as well as those interested in issues involving public service. So you've got the ideal audience for your message uh, on this. We're particularly glad to welcome uh, Bill English, the Minister of Finance, Deputy Prime Minister in New Zealand, who has a, a wide-ranging public sector reform brief, as you'll see from the uh, Better Public Services, which is the theme of a, 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 a key programme which has been launched by the New Zealand government. He arrived in the UK today. He had meetings with Francis Maud, who is... Um, very familiar to us. I think I'm I, I, I trying to work out how many speeches you've made, Francis, at the Institute this year, but we're delighted you're, you're, um, at the, you're our um, venue of choice. Um, particularly glad because th today's event unites not only the comparison of New, uh, UK and New Zealand and vice versa, as we emphasise in our title, of learning experiences. And it's very interesting, having seen the presentation we're going to hear from Bill English in a second, how parallel many of the issues are. They're remarkably similar in many ways, albeit given the, uh, a slightly local slant. Because two of the key issues we address at the Institute of Government are one, how do you achieve reform? It runs through all the work we're doing. We're, we're producing a report in about a month's time on um, transforming uh, departments where a number of people in this um, audience have been involved in the work on that following our work with a number of government departments and that will be launched um, in uh, about five weeks time. Also um, an accountability project which is a year-long project we've been running. Uh, we started and we decided to start with looking at the experience in New Zealand. We're also going to look at the experience in Australia there and, and with the, this event, another event we're running next week, um, and also various other uh, work we're doing to publish a briefing paper on that. This is very much, in, I regard, as in parallel with the work Francis has commissioned um, on the policy um, fund um, with IPPR. We, I've said to IPPR we, we were delighted to share our work with them, which we're going to do. Guy Lodge, who's doing it, isn't here because he's up at the Labour conference, but um, very w welcome to do that. We decided not to bid, as is known, um, because we already had our project underway and we wanted to um, preserve the timetable and the independence of that. But that, that doesn't mean we're, we're not behind the um, uh, intention to do the research on that and we will be doing it ourselves. Now, I'd like to, um, the, the order will be um, first Bill English will speak, then Francis Maud, then I will raise a couple of topics. It's going to be a fairly um, tight timetable because um, the Minister's got to get away, he's got a very crowded programme. But we're gonna, he's going to start with a presentation of the reform agenda, um, particularly in the tight fiscal context in New Zealand, um, which I think, as I say, will have many echoes here. Bill English. Well, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to uh, what in New Zealand would be a very large audience for <laughs> public policy. Uh, but uh, having flown 30 hours to get here and gone straight to the Minister's office, we've plunged right in. Uh, <coughs> we're spending a few days here covering uh, pu public sector reform, also talking to our lenders, because we're borrowing, selling New Zealand government bonds here. And I have the um, good fortune also to have a daughter attending university here, but mercifully uh, protected from the impact of tertiary fees increases <laughs> uh, because of the beneficence of the Girdlers Society, okay. who for 80 years have every year um, paid for a young New Zealander to attend Cambridge University. Uh, so better public services, I'm not sure how the buttons are going to work here. Let's see. Oh, something's not going. We've, um, I don't know who's in charge of this. Can someone make Can this you? thing work? Yep. <laughs> it's always the same, isn't it? <laughs> uh, look, the, the context for these uh, pressures on public, which one? That one there? On public service are very similar in the UK and in uh, New Zealand. The one, big, the one single difference uh, is that our total level of government debt is considerably lower than here. Uh, like for like, our net debt is going to peak at around 30% of GDP, and I think here it's somewhere uh, in the region of 70 to 80. <coughs> so uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is a wee bit closer in our, cases, in our case. 
Uh, government has set a bunch of priorities earlier in the year. We've spent quite a bit of time getting clarity. The public are in a very pragmatic mood in New Zealand. They understand the world's changed. They understand their behaviour uh, is changing, and government is. And we've been able to, therefore, have quite a, had a sort of non-controversial, uh, strong focus. The one uh, other difference between the UK and New Zealand is we have to rebuild our second largest city. Um, <coughs> it's had certainly had an impact on our fiscal aggregates, but just to give you a sense of the size of it, uh, the, re the capital cost of the rebuild is equivalent of about 12% uh, of GDP, uh, somewhere around 25 billion US, 20 billion US dollars. Uh, we've got moderate growth, which helps an awful lot. Uh, we're in a less urgent situation than the UK, so we're expecting a growth path of 2 to 3 per cent. Uh, our Treasury, like yours, is persistently gloomy and always telling us it's going to get worse. Uh, I fear they might be somewhere near right this time. Uh, so that's why the line is coming down. But that, that's a very helpful background. A fair bit of that is the earthquake rebuild. Uh, as you can imagine, a project of that size is going to have a big impact. Uh, our household debt is considerably worse than here. In fact, it's among the worst in the developed world. You can see it peaking there at about 150% of GDP. That is up there with Spain and Portugal. That is why we get around the world talking to our lenders, <laughs> to make sure that they know that they're going to get their money back. We do not want to be someone who falls into the category where they think they might not get their money back. Uh, and the yields on government bonds are the lowest they've been in 40 years, so we're on the right side of the equation and we want to stay there. So our problem is much more household and private sector debt than it is government debt in the long run. Uh, but we have the same kind of deleveraging dynamics going on. Uh, we've got to get back to um, get back to surplus, that's government debt, uh, that's uh, yeah, the net debt, that's a bit higher, I don't know why they've got 35%, it's actually going to peak at 30%, they've added something else in there. <coughs> we set out pretty early on, um, in a different political context than here, we got elected just after the Lehman's crash, in fact we launched a large tax package on the Thursday, and Lehman's crashed on the Friday. <laughs> So we were somewhat caught short. Uh, we were elected from opposition on a pretty, on a very moderate platform. Uh, so despite the fact that the world changed between the start of the, the election campaign <coughs> and it being elected, uh, we decided to keep faith with our promises. And that has presented us with a particular challenge around public services. Uh, and it's forced us to uh, do uh, take a different point of view than just getting cash savings out, because the public were not uh, had no expectation of that uh, that kind of situation. So we focused on maintaining and improving public services, not cutting them. And we said that right from the start. We're going to have more for less, not less for less. And it has been a fairly uh, powerful guide uh, to the politicians. So <coughs> it's forced us to get clarity on our government goals, uh, focus on better services, not less services. And of course, um, that all needs stronger leadership. And I'm sure your public service is similar to here as it was in New Zealand. The skill set that was built up uh, up to 2008 turned out to be uh, almost irrelevant to the circumstances past 2008. And if I could characterise those slightly unfairly, the public service got very good at managing up, that is sucking money out of the system through ministers, and not very good at all at managing down, that is understanding their organisations and what the hell they were doing, let alone whether they were achieving anything. Uh, we have taken a pretty strongly uh, collaborative approach. Now, I outlined there efficiency, dividends and so on, none of that is particularly new, but a couple of key features of it have, one, have been these. Uh, one is spending a lot of time with chief executives as a collective, 
reflecting the fact that we operate collectively as ministers a lot, helped by the fact that all our ministers are in one building. Uh, so my day as the finance minister and deputy prime minister consists of uh, mainly meeting with groups of ministers, uh, usually accompanied by reasonably large groups of officials. So it's not unusual for us to have half a dozen ministers around the table and 15 officials. Uh, and I have <coughs> it, it gets uh, clarity among the group about what they're trying to achieve. It creates peer accountability and it leaves officials usually, not always, usually in no doubt about what is intended so that they don't go off and spend months writing contesting bits of paper. Uh, that actually the decision's been made, they know where it's going. And increasingly we're using it as a problem solving process. So we go in with a problem on the table and we like to come out with um, the next steps that we're going to take rather than using the formal decision making process to achieve that. The second is the four year budget plans. Annual budget rounds, uh, it, well put, it's, put it this way, if you've got any choice about the amount of cash, then annual budget rounds are a nonsense for large complex organisations. So we set out to ensure that the leadership of these organisations don't spend a whole lot of energy four months of the year trying to beat the budget system. So most of them have known since the 2010 budget what their revenue lines are for the next four years and they will not change and they are shrinking. So that's inclusive of their three or six percent efficiency dividend. So most of them have falling revenue lines, uh, they're certain about those and they have to meet the objectives but also manage their costs within those lines. We're not going back to take more off them but they are not going to darken our door looking for more money. So in this next budget we will actually only negotiate with three ministers over their funding. The rest of it, it's um, up to them. Uh, just a couple of examples uh, <coughs> to show how this is working a bit because we're <coughs> in year four now. Uh, probably our most comprehensive change program is in the, the Defence Forces. Uh, which are usually the hardest nut to crack. Paramilitary monopolies and military monopolies are the hardest organisations to get change in. Police, cops, fire service, we all know that. Uh, what's worked here has been two things. One is the Defence Forces getting absolutely clear what they want and that is the well-equipped frontline soldier. Uh, and that has meant they now don't think it's quite so important to have three separate administrative infrastructures for Army, Navy, Air Force. And so those have been collapsed. The second thing is forcing ministers to go through a lengthy, challenging and difficult strategic process. So making them think hard about what it is they really do want out of the Defence Forces. Uh, and we invested a lot of time in that and having done so, uh, the Defence Forces are now delivering very substantial change, large scale savings uh, being reinvested. The Defence Forces will not get another dollar till 2017. They know what their funding is and they're cutting overhead uh, to get the funding to where they know it needs to go. Uh, accident compensation, I'm not sure what it's called here. Uh, just to demonstrate the benefits of better management. They don't have it. They don't have it? Okay, so this is work accidents. Uh, so it's a social insurance scheme for work accidents. Uh, we inherited it losing billions. A very strong focus on simple things like getting the rehabilitation rate to, to improve rather than deteriorate. Uh, stop writing law for wider entitlements but not put levies up. Uh, means that now uh, we are able to deliver what is effectively across the board tax cuts. Because everyone pays the ACC levy, it's a bit like your social insurance levies, and we're actually going to be able to reduce them over two or three years. That those reductions will be the equivalent of one and a half to two percent of GDP. Uh, effectively a tax cut. We, having spent two or three years carving away at this, 
uh, it became reasonably clear to us that these traditional problems, you know, cross-government activity, collaboration, you know, people live in families and communities, not government departments. You know, the parliamentary appropriation process determines how government does everything. It's nuts, really, necessary, but um, pretty silly. And so <coughs> we thought the only way to really drive front-end change is to take an old hackneyed tool, outcomes, which had never really been implemented properly in New Zealand despite it appearing in legislation 20 years ago, and put, in this case, particularly put the politicians to the test. Why would the public service take anything seriously unless we're willing to lay our uh, political fortunes on the line for success? So we went through about a six-month process, mainly among ministers actually, and then later with departments, to produce uh, ten uh, result areas. And each one of these has a named chief executive who's responsible for them. So of the ten, and they're, they're reasonably precise, um, we can say it's that minister and that chief executive. We have an election in 2014. The Prime Minister announced these. He has the power of appointment of the Cabinet completely to himself, like you do here, and uh, that is creating quite a strong focus. Because Ministers know they've got to deliver, uh, and Chief Executives know that if they're not getting onto this very quickly, 2014 will be pretty chaotic. Because they'll have the Minister coming back to work in the middle of January saying, what the hell's going on? Our numbers have got worse, not better. In some areas, uh, we've got, the, the, well, in fact, most areas, these are building on success that's already in the pipeline. If I can just use the, the, the measures around reducing crime, a rate, nothing fancy here, they just, we want to reduce reoffending rates, because they're very high in New Zealand. Uh, crime rates are actually dropping about 5% per year now. That's partly demographic. Uh, it's also partly because we've now got a proper analysis of the law and order pipeline. Uh, and it's amazing how much difference it makes when you have collective, a, a, a collective of police courts and the prison service simply looking at what they're doing. You know, because for they used to, they were getting so it was the fastest rising cost in the government when we became the government. They were getting more money than they knew what to do with, more people than they knew what to do with. Uh, when that stopped and they started thinking harder about what they were doing. Uh, they've already had quite an impact. Uh, when I became, when we became government, uh, we were told we'd need two or three new prisons. We said no, we'll build one more. That's it. Uh, and for the first time in a generation, we're actually going to close prisons before Christmas. Uh, and we re we've taken a lot of notice of the welfare debate in the UK. What we're doing here, what we've done here, is create a notional insurance idea. So we've calculated a long-term liability for our current stock of people on benefit, 12% uh, of working age New Zealanders, build up of hardcore, just like here, uh, disabilities, disability benefits and so on. And the chief executive of MSD, which is the equivalent <coughs> of your um, work and pensions department, uh, will have a performance agreement that says the current liability is $78 billion. Your job is to get it down. Um, so that will, that is in his agreement. This process is underway now. Uh, it's an, uh, an example of something I'll point out at the end. That there's the justice one. We'll flick through that. Um, this is a survey that's run every year. I think mainly because of our rhetoric but partly because of the delivery, public satisfaction with public services is rising, not falling, as we cut the budgets. Uh, one of the key aspects of this, though, is um, that it's become, we, we, because we've taken a longer term point of view, we've been, we're able to align our fiscal objectives with those of the community. So I'm now going around saying, as ministers increasingly are, 
The right result for the community is the right result for our books. That is one less prisoner reoffending, one less child abuse case, one more uh, child getting through their 16 year old qualification, one more young solo mum with a child actually under supervision with a responsible adult. Uh, <coughs> those are the things that are gonna give us the benefits. And particularly in the welfare reform, we are actually spending more money now, not less, uh, but we believe the payoffs for that are going to be quite large over the next four or five years. So we are going to have the core government expenditure, it's not on there, the core government expenditure is going to drop from 35% of GDP to 30% of GDP over the next five years, and I think by year four or five it will still be dropping because of the investment <coughs> we've made now in better services. Uh, and that is one reason why the fiscal approach is supported generally across political parties, uh, because they see it starting to deliver um, actual benefits to their communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Prime Minister. It was absolutely fascinating. I think there are a few things uh, there which Francis might like, particularly those at the beginning of the talk about growth rates and so on, and, and levels of debt. Now, Francis Moore. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, indeed, uh, Peter. And uh, no, lots of, there's lots to be envious of there. I mean, a growth, a growth rate at uh, 2 to 3 percent, that'd be nice. Um, <laughs> at debt levels at uh, 30 percent of GDP, we'd settle for that. Um, but actually, what's fascinating about that is how many uh, points of uh, comparison and similarity there are in, in the approaches, which is why I think the the um, comparison is so, is so interesting, coming, our systems coming from the same heritage, the same background, the same legal system, uh, all, all of that gives them um, uh, so much for us to draw from, from each other and uh, certainly had a fascinating talk with the Deputy Prime Minister uh, earlier. Uh, and um, uh, the, the title of this uh, discussion, Creating Better uh, Public Services, um, uh, I was really interested that the Deputy Prime Minister's um, sort of strap line is more for less. Uh, and there's kind of a, a, a tacit defeatist assumption, really, that you can't get more for less. Um, I remember uh, many years ago, I was uh, a, a Treasury Minister. We created something called the uh, Citizens' Charter, which was the first attempt, really, in, in the British government to uh, have some measurement of the quality of public services. And there was what I always felt to be a slightly defeatist um, sort of tacit uh, conspiracy within um, the government, which was spending departments saying, don't uh, encourage us to improve the quality because we, unless you're going to give us more money. And the Treasury saying, don't ask them to improve the quality of their services or they'll demand more money. Mm -hmm. The idea that you could actually get more for less, better quality public services for less, was kind of alien. And yet the environment in which we're in today not only makes it necessary, but shows daily how it's possible. Uh, and uh, I'll say a little bit about some of the things we're doing um, from the center of government to drive cost out of government services. But I mean, obviously the background is a common one. The public's demand for, in terms of the quality, the ex expectations in terms of the quality and the convenience of public services is rising all the time, year by year. Uh, people can avail themselves of services within the ordinary daily lives uh, that they buy from the public, from the private sector, which get better. Not universally, not uh, in a straight line, but year after year get better and more convenient. Uh, and um, we don't, haven't been delivering in nearly enough places that uh, in the public sector. And of course, the other part of the background is there isn't any money. Um, uh, we have uh, hideous levels of debt, a bigger deficit than uh, uh, anywhere else in the, had a bigger deficit than anywhere else in the developed world. Uh, and so we have to, we're obliged to deliver uh, more for less. Um, and of course, public spending cuts generally are unpopular, but actually the public spending cuts, which are about driving cost out of government are popular. Uh, people think that's a good thing to do uh, and they want to see their money spent better. Uh, and our starting point was that 
uh, over the last uh, years, uh, while uh, productivity in the private services sector rose by nearly 30% in Britain, in the uh, public sector it was at best static. Um, and if uh, productivity in the public sector had risen by a comparable amount, the um, position, our, both our economic position, because that in itself is a huge drag on, on economic growth and uh, economic performance, but the fiscal position would be radically uh, different. Um, and so driving cost out um, to drive up uh, productivity is of absolutely fundamental importance. And it was against this background that we developed what we call, I believe, consultants. We don't employ consultants anymore in government, but uh, it's what they would call it if they were allowed in. Um, the loose type balance. Um, and in any big complex uh, dispersed organization like a government or maybe a multinational corporation, there are some things you control militantly from the center. You would control, obviously, strategy and strategic communications and cash, kind of. Um, you would uh, control big projects that carry uh, operational and financial uh, reputational risk. You control property. You wouldn't allow one bit of the organization to make dispositions on property that damage the whole. Uh, you wouldn't allow the position where we should be found in Bristol, for example, where central government in its different manifestations was occupying no fewer than 115 uh, different addresses with all the cost and the opportunity cost of separate working that comes uh, with that. You would control um, ICT infrastructure um, so that there's a co there are common platforms of it so that interoperability becomes the norm rather than, as it is now, the uh, exception. You control uh, broad HR operating standards. You'd buy common goods and services on an aggregated basis to leverage the uh, volume um, that scale gives a government as a very big customer. Um, and, um, and those are things you would control uh, tightly. Uh, and the loose part is, because people often say, well, Francis, we hear a lot about the tight. Where does, when does the loose come in? The loose comes in actually by pushing responsibility for frontline delivery as close to the frontline as you can get. And one of the ways in which we're uh, doing that is by encouraging the public service mutual model, where groups of public sector workers uh, form themselves into an employee-led entity, which most of them are proving to be by the choice of the staff, not for profit, uh, spin themselves out, deliver the public service on a um, contractual rather than a line-managed um, hierarchical uh, basis with stupendous uh, productivity uh, improvements uh, that can be delivered almost overnight, actually. Um, and that's loose. That's actually people who... Um, the what of what they're delivering is formed in the contract. How they do it is up to them. Uh, and what people in public service mutuals consistently say is, we'd never go back and work for the council, the health authority, the government. Why not, you ask? Because we can do things. The model we're in, we can do things. We can see what needs to be done and we can, uh, we can do it. It's very uh, powerful. Uh, and the, can you deliver more for less? Is it just about those kinds of sort of human aspects of productivity? Uh, th those are powerful and, and achievable, uh, and sh we're showing in different sectors already how they can be delivered. Payment by results models um, uh, can deliver, start to deliver uh, this as well, where services are commissioned on a payment by results uh, model from outside providers. Um, you can also these days find uh, s astonishing savings by going outside the old model of the usual suspect suppliers. Um, I, I recently discovered um, an example where the incumbent uh, ICT supplier for a part of government uh, was bidding uh, four million pounds for a particular service to continue. Um, a small challenger provider uh, came in and offered to do it and has agreed to do it for 50,000 pounds for not very much more than 1% of the incumbent's cost. Now, these are not modest savings. I mean, uh, I'm not suggesting all of them. We'll, we'll get that every time. That'd be nice. Um, but actually, you don't need many of those on, on, on a big scale to see stupendous changes, stupendous uh, improvements. Uh, and so you start to see very real capital productivity increases alongside 
um, alongside labor, human uh, productivity. And on the human side, um, uh, we have um, uh, issues with the need for widely acknowledged in the civil service and in the leadership of the civil service for reform. Now, it is now a, um, a kind of settled view, really, without contest, that every organization under the sun is either getting better or it's getting worse. Uh, you don't always know that it's getting worse. You may think it's fine and it's going along on an even keel, but if you think that, in two years' time, you'll find that it's got worse. All organizations are getting better or getting worse. And if they're not getting better, they will definitely uh, be getting worse. And our civil service in this country has many huge strengths, but it does need to uh, reform and change um, to uh, meet the challenges uh, of the time, which are greater than anything we've seen. It's smaller today than at any time since the Second World War. It's fallen from around 500,000 um, uh, civil servants when the coalition government was formed two and a half years ago to around 420 uh, something uh, people now and planned to fall by 2015 to 380,000 uh, just in department's own, own plans. Um, and this has meant, and Sir Bob Kerslake and Sir Jeremy Hayward have been really very clear about this, this imposes demands on the civil service to operate very differently and to transform and change. Yes, there is a demand for change from ministers, but uh, also from civil servants themselves. We do these annual people surveys, which have thrown up consistently concerns about performance management in the civil service, a culture that's overly uh, bureaucratic, risk averse, very hierarchical, which is much more about behavior than it is about uh, structure uh, and organization. And the focus there is too often, and these are things civil servants themselves say, <coughs> on process, not on outcomes. So uh, change is, is wanted. The public wants services to be delivered better. And this means efficiency and productivity have to continue to improve. And that's why Sir Bob Kerslake and I published the Civil Service Reform Plan. We set out the first stage in our reform program. It brings a series of uh, range of practical reforms, none of them turning the system upside down, all of them really <laughs> in themselves incremental. But if implemented, which they, they must be, uh, will make it a civil service that is smaller, yes, flatter, faster. It'll be more digital. Uh, we need to be an organization where, like British Airways, now a, uh, a company where everything that isn't about flying airplanes uh, is done online, uh, which is better for the passenger and the customer, but much cheaper and more efficient as well. And we're light years as, as a government, as an organization behind that, light years. Uh, behind that. So more digital, more unified, a theme that Sir Bob Kerslake has stressed uh, repeatedly. We don't manage our talent in a, in a corporate, unified way. Um, I talked about the ICT infrastructure, which, um, which um, emphasizes uh, insularity of different bits of government against the interoperability. And so interesting to hear the Deputy Prime Minister talking about the model in New Zealand where ministers work together uh, in the same uh, building, which focusing uh, uh, on the need for much more joined up government, uh, something that all governments everywhere in all systems will talk about and um, without ever there being a perfect uh, solution. But one of the things that we need to see, uh, as w again widely recognized in the civil service, is to sharpen uh, accountability. Our system works very properly on, on the basis that ministers are accountable to parliament. That's absolutely right. And and you will hear demands from um, uh, in Parliament uh, for senior civil servants to be more directly accountable to Parliament. Um, and uh, that is not part of uh, the way our system works, nor need it be. Um, what our system requires is that civil servants are directly accountable to ministers. But, um, uh, and in general, that works well. But I in too many uh, occasions, uh, it hasn't been quite like that. Uh, and it isn't just ministers in the coalition government, but ministers in the last government as well have too often found that decisions they've made do not then get implemented. It's not happening uh, all the time. In most cases, it does happen, but too many cases where it doesn't happen. Um, 
and there are cases where permanent secretaries have blocked agreed government policy from going ahead or advised other officials not to implement ministerial decisions. And of course, that's utterly unacceptable uh, in our system. A and of course, the damage that does to the system is that it undermines the excellent work that most civil servants do, dedicated public servants with imbued with that public service ethos that <coughs> is so valuable. And of course, ministers should, and they're obliged to under the ministerial code, and indeed they'd be bonkers not to, seek and listen to the advice of their officials. A minister who didn't do that would be uh, insane. Uh, and yet, uh, once you've sought the advice and you've listened to it and you challenge and interrogate, and full opportunity for the uh, everything around that decision to be properly uh, examined and challenged. Once a decision's made, of course, uh, the decision must be implemented. And ministers in, in our system, and I guess in the New Zealand system as well, come with very small personal staffs of people who are not uh, civil servants. Indeed, for junior ministers, they have absolutely none at all. The entirety of their staff are, 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 are civil servants. And it's simply not possible, nor should it be even necessary to think about what would be involved for the minister himself or herself to try to track every single decision that's being made to check whether it's being implemented. You have to be able to assume that that's happening because actually at the end of the day, it's the minister who uh, has to go along to the House of Commons and be uh, interrogated and, and um, interviewed uh, as it's always so delightful on the Today programme about the performance of their departments. Uh, and so we want to strengthen the accountability of the civil service. Uh, and uh, so we've announced we want to strengthen the role of ministers in the appointment of, of permanent secretaries. There are many ways in which this can be done. We want to clarify what's expected of every permanent secretary. So for the first time, we'll be publishing their objectives. Uh, and so it'll be clear uh, what is expected to be delivered and which will be very useful both actually for permanent secretaries in their own departments because it'll, again it'll be absolutely explicit what is being expected of the permanent secretary as the leader, the official leader of that department as well as uh, for the public. These will be agreed in advance with ministers and with the prime minister and updated periodically will also be bringing in ways, which should happen routinely but doesn't always happen, for ministers to feed into the appraisals of civil servants whose work they see and whose work they um, have a, 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 a close interest in. It should say, happen as a matter of course, doesn't always. Uh, and it's very important that the appraisal of officials reflects the input of both ministers as well as their peers and their uh, direct reports and the people they report so uh, there's much that we need to do through the civil service uh, reform plan. One of the ways in which we strengthen accountability, and we were discussing this uh, with the Deputy Prime Minister earlier, is having much better uh, management information. Management information produced on a directly comparable, consistent basis between departments is a fundamental tool for accountability. Um, and it's not always very popular, but, and it was disappointing to find that in too many cases, um, departments were producing data on common areas <coughs> of spend on, on a different basis, with different definitions. So you could never compare apples in one department with apples uh, in another department. And too often the definitions changed, so you didn't have a consistent series. So you couldn't compare apples this year with apples last year. And yet with that consistent, comparable management information comes inescapable uh, accountability. And the new senior non-executives we put in place uh, under Lord Brown's leadership um, to strengthen the role of departmental boards in the governance of, of, of departments to provide challenge and, and advice and supervision, um, a constant plea of theirs has been, which has been reflected also, I think, in the work of the Institute, Peter, um, a plea for better data, for more better quality, comparable uh, management information. Uh, and this has been a bit like uh, pulling teeth to get um, progress here, but we have got progress and we will deliver that. All of this um, will make uh, our system, I think, 
um, capable of, of um, improvement. None of it revolutionary, none of it to upset the overturn, the basic uh, North Cot Rebellion um, uh, <coughs> system, which I've been a, a settlement, of, of which I've been a, a very strong and, and vocal supporter. But it has to move and change with the times to become, as we've said, you know, flatter, smaller, faster, more digital, more unified, focus on outcome, not process, um, better managed with better performance management, uh, with more accountability for delivery, and frankly, more fun to work for. Because actually, um, a lot of civil servants themselves express their frustration. And civil servants who feel themselves <coughs> empowered and trusted to do their job and get on and make decisions and implement them are people who will be more productive and who will get more satisfaction from what they do. And that absolutely is a key part of it with modern terms and conditions. And that doesn't just mean about pay and rations. Actually, it almost so means about workplaces that work for them, technology <coughs> that works for them, um, and a, 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 whole, a holistic approach to um, the workplace which actually supports productivity and creativity rather than denies it. So there's much for us to learn from New Zealand, <coughs> which is why we've asked that we've commissioned a study from IPPR specifically to look at uh, the New Zealand model, but also the Australian, the Singapore, and others where there may be lessons uh, for us to learn. And we're very much looking forward to learning more from you, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Before opening it out, can I, can I ask you both? I mean, one of the interesting themes, you were outlining very clearly the objectives you set, um, chief executives of departments in various areas. You, you talked about defense, the uh, in law, law and order area. Um, in terms of holding to uh, account, who monitors the performance? And, and, and I'll, I'll switch that on to Francis as well. And how does that work, the actual process? Given you're doing it four years ahead, you mm. express absolute clarity about what's going to happen in the four years, mm. circumstances can intervene. So how are they monitored in a, in a fair and consistent way? Well, the, uh, the <coughs> we, we've been looking for the right balance here between uh, a system that can actually operate as opposed to a, a, a widespread compliance-driven mm. high-cost system. So it's... In terms of the 10 results that the government's focusing on, it starts with the Prime Minister conducting a discussion with each minister uh, every six months. Uh, and each year, uh, those expectations are expressed in a letter from him to the minister. So that puts a pretty strong personal edge on it. Um, and then the uh, <coughs> minister then, of course, is hi well highly incentivised to uh, transmit that through the department. And increasingly, that does involve working with other ministers. So it's explicitly referred to uh, in the accountability, in the letters, uh, and increasingly in the chief executive accountability documents that um, they need to be seen as someone who is able to work with other people. Uh, well, rather than someone who is seen to be unable to work with other people, even if it makes their department uh, more powerful uh, and influential in their eyes. Uh, <coughs> the, um, alongside that, we're working towards a kind of corporate head office type approach. So we have three central agencies. It's a bit different than the structure here, uh, of which the Treasury is one, State Services Commission, and um, the Department of Prime Minister. Prime Minister's Department. So increasingly we're pushing them into, instead of uh, a lowest common denominator among the agencies, you know, what they can agree to, uh, pushing them towards uh, exercising judgment across the whole of government. So the most useful output from that process, from my point of view, is a traffic light system. So it cuts through all the statements of intent and all the annual cycle of the parliamentary stuff, which is not designed to actually allow you to manage anything, it's Absolutely. designed for demo democratic yeah. accountability, which is quite a different function from actually making any, any difference out in the community. Uh, <coughs> but the, the, the corporate centre is now has to exercise judgement 
right? So they showed you the traffic lights that say these three departments actually are under real stress. The ministerial relationships not, might, may not be working, um, they're not getting on top of their budget cycle, whatever. Uh, so that accountability is increasingly focused on judgment rather than compliance. And I think that's quite a critical mind shift, having people willing to say that's not working, okay. rather than people saying, well, we filled out the forms. Yeah. How do you see it working here? I mean, who's going to monitor the Budget Secretary set an objective? Who's actually going to monitor that? Well, the um, performance manager, the permanent secretaries, will be essentially all permanent secretaries report either to the head of the civil service, most of them do, or to, um, in, in kind of line management terms, or, or, or to the cabinet secretary. Um, and um, the uh, when uh, Bob and Jeremy do their um, performance appraisals, they will draw heavily on what um, the Secretary of State says and ministers mm -hmm. say, but also will involve heavily the, and this is where I think the role of the boards can be very important, um, the non-executive members uh, of, of the board. But you know, we should all be doing 360 mm -hmm. um, degree um, appraisals these days. I, I've just undergone one, um, uh, undertaken by the Institute for Government, um, <laughs> which was a, um, um, Interesting experience, um, <laughs> and um, and a good one actually. I mean, it was it was it was very good. Um, but so these things ought to be done, need to be done quite rigorously. Mm. And you know, the point that's constantly made by civil servants in people survey, the people surveys, and anecdotally, that performance management has not been done consistently and rigorously, needs to apply at the top just as much as right throughout um, the uh, the organisations. And that's why having um, performance ob objectives for permanent secretaries, which are agreed and which are done in quite a rigorous way um, and are, are then public and then some matching of achievement against those objectives is, is a much more transparent um, and rigorous way of doing it. But, you know, we are in the early stages of this. Because so another feature in New Zealand is, is the chief executives have a, a fixed term contract, don't you? It, it, it's, it's three or five years. Five. Five. It, I mean, because there was talk here that some permanent secretary appointments going back a few years were for a fixed term. Does that attract you? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's really <coughs> difficult to do under mm. um, our employment laws um, because you've got, I mean, certainly for internal appointments because these are people who have employment rights and you can't suddenly kind of truncate them by putting a fixed term in. You can, and, and this does happen, with mm. people who are brought in from, from outside. Um, but it, it I, I'm told anyway that it's not possible to Im bring in these kinds of fixed term arrangements for people who uh, get appointed from within the civil service to senior roles. Right, let's open it up to questions. Um, we've got about a quarter of an hour for questions. Let me just keep them fairly tight, please. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to public officials rather than journalists first, if you don't mind, Judy. Um, Paul, at the back. Uh, Paul Evans, um, House of Commons Park. Uh, Mr English, is, these are two related questions really addressed to English. Mr English, you um, said more than once that there's a tension between the uh, sort of appropriation system, the parliamentary appropriation system, which is delivering what you want to deliver. And I wondered if you were making any effort to reconcile that tension at all when you thought it was an inevitable flaw. And Mr Moore was very against the idea of civil servants being directly accountable in Parliament. Do you share his view on that? On the first one, uh, <coughs> it's w we're just uh, going to pass some legislation over the next six months which are designed to give more elbow room within the structures that are dictated by the parliamentary appro appropriation process. And uh, Because if we want smaller, flatter, more effective then you're going to need people in the system having more ability to shift the money around. Uh, we are willing to do that where the objectives are pretty clear. We're probably not willing to do it in those parts of, the, of public service in which you have some where uh, they're there doing a job that's always going to have to be done. Uh, so that's it. So yes, we're about to legislate. Probably the, mo the biggest changes since we first since the big changes back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and they, but they will 
reflect practice to a large extent. I mean, we're already working more collectively, so the appropriation process needs to accommodate that. It needs to make it easy for ministers to walk into a room and in half an hour shift 10 million around and walk out and it's done. Right, without having to go through cabinet committees and cabinet and everything. Uh, or even if that happens, it's after the fact rather than the decision making process. Your second issue about direct accountability. Look, we're, we're reasonably happy with where ours is. Uh, ministers can have a pretty direct effect if they use the tools. And that's a general point I make about accountability is our systems actually have the tools. Often the politicians don't use them, don't understand them. Uh, so basic things, a lot of basics, if they do the basic process stuff around being clear what they want and writing it down and then reading the thing from the department about whether they have actually gone and done it, uh, then you can have a powerful effect. But there's no change in the rules will make it work if people don't use the basic tools. We, we think we've got enough we've got enough of them. Inevitably there is tension though. It doesn't matter what the rules are. There'll be an argument over whether the official should turn up to explain it to the media or the minister. And uh, we've gone, I think, swung back a bit more to ministers. Uh, there was a phase there where officials were pushed out, in my view, a bit too often. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't comment on the situation. Francis, do you want to come in on this at all? Um, I think it's very interesting uh, uh, insight there. Um, it, I mean, it is a different, uh, uh, a, a different nuance. I mean, we do not generally have civil servants who are publicly accountable. Um, I'm not. I mean, uh, I, I'm not sort of dead set against more direct accountability of, of civil servants. Um, but I think you can't kind of have it, it, it both ways. You can't have a position where ministers only are accountable to Parliament and publicly for what a department does, without the ministers then having any ability to make a difference in the people who actually have to deliver the things for which the minister is accountable. I mean, if, if ministers are to be uh, prevented from making a choice of the, the, the key appointment, which is the chief executive, the permanent secretary uh, of the department, then I think the pressure um, for uh, there to be much more direct accountability um, at, with, with probably much more kind of um, rigorous uh, definition and description of, of the objectives, the implementation objectives, which we are, you know, our system is not well, well um, uh, attuned to, to doing this. I think the pressure will become hard to, hard to resist. Now let me take a, a, a couple together. Um, Robert Hessel. Oh, no, 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 move, move along, yeah. Um, uh, br br one question, Robert, not two. <laughs> Just one. The, the one big difference uh, in New Zealand is the State Services Commission. In fact, it's part of the central agency being part responsible for managing the performance of senior officials, but also Right, well, well, well that's, that's one very interesting one. <coughs> Vernon Bogdan there. It seems to me that there are two possible dangers to Francis Maud's ideas. The first is in the appraisal of civil servants. But I think by contrast with okay. the private sector, the civil service tends to be collective and it's sometimes very difficult to disentangle the specific contributions made by individual senior civil servants. But second and more important, the greater role that ministers play in appraising officials and appointing senior officials, the greater the danger of uh, officials becoming pliable to the interested ministers and becoming more political. And if, as you say, that uh, officials have not implemented government policy effectively, either in this government or the last, it seems to me the answer to this is to bring in your own people, bring in expert special advisors who can oversee that problem of implementation. And that way, you preserve the barrier between the politicians and the civil servants who can give advice that sometimes ministers don't like. Mm. Sorry. Uh, 
I just wanted to invite you to reflect on the difference between blocking, which you say um, senior civil servants are doing, blocking ministerial initiatives, and challenge. Mm, um, because you know, civil servants have responsibilities to challenge ministers when there's poor value for money, mm. when things are infeasible, when they're irregular, or whether they're un oh, unlawful. Absolutely. And uh, it's sometimes very hard in the public statements on this to get a mm. sense of what you mean okay. when you're complaining about it. And yeah. also, what's the legitimate behaviour that is challenging and an illegitimate behaviour that's blocking? Okay. Let me deal explicitly with that because it's a really important point. My objection is not to challenge. I encourage um, an environment where officials uh, can give the most candid advice um, and nothing I like more than an argument. Um, uh, it's uh, what my complaint is not remotely about challenge. My complaint is actually the reverse. My complaint is where there isn't challenge, where there, there no one, where I'm not being told this is a terrible thing to do. I don't mind that at all. I will have that argument. I will interrogate the advice, and, and I will come to a view. And no minister who, in their right minds, would not do that. My objection is where there isn't challenge, and a decision is made, and then it doesn't happen, and then it <coughs> kind of quietly fades into the long grass. And nothing, it's never seen on any, any examples, Francis? Well, no, because it's not actually, it's in video. I mean, uh, uh, there are plenty of examples. Mm. Um, there are many, many, many more examples of decisions actually ha being implemented. And so I'm not saying this is anything like uh, universal, but it's in, it, you can't give the examples without actually fingering individuals, which would be uh, in video. So it's a very different uh, phenomenon. Challenge. Excellent. That's <coughs> exactly what you want. Um, but it's when there isn't the challenge, but it doesn't happen. And that's actually, that's very corrosive of the system because it corrodes trust. Um, and, you know, just to pick up uh, Vernon's point about, I'm actually rather relieved here, there are only two dangers in what I'm proposing. <laughs> so it's a rather modest count. Um, the... Um, uh, and and I, I used an interesting phrase, the danger of officials being too pliable to ministers' wishes. Well, actually, that is what the Civil Service Code says, that actually if ministers properly make a decision, a lawful decision, and they've followed the code and they've you know, sought and listened to advice, it is actually the obligation of officials to deliver it, to implement it. If they don't, if there are proper objections, um, then there is the ability which I wouldn't at all object to um, being deployed, of a permanent secretary and accounting officer saying to the minister, uh, I think this is the wrong thing to do, um, and, and I will only do it if you issue a written direction. Okay. That's perfectly legitimate. And if the minister's confident enough in his or her judgment, having assessed the risks and the advantages and being willing to defend it and make the case, I would be perfectly willing for that to be followed. And these are all really proper ways in which our system can work and should work. What is corrosive is the kind of the passive, the non-challenge followed by non-compliance and non-implementation. And, you know, the truth is, you, you know, you, we could have a system where ministers bring into office with them an army of kind of their own appointees who are there <coughs> to double-check and, and enforce and follow up <coughs> and so on. But actually, you're then imposing a kind of whole new approach, which shouldn't be necessary. It shouldn't be necessary. Um, you know, there's a sort of view in um, um, sometimes in, in Whitehall that, that special advisors are there only to uh, uh, put a sort of overlay of politics on um, an otherwise um, uh, uh, imperfect system. <coughs> actually, what special advisors spend most of their time doing is following up on things, seeing whether things have happened, not actually be being political, but they're the only people in the department who have an undivided loyalty to the minister. And that's why this thing about appraisals is so important, because when you're doing things which are countercultural, uh, which actually challenge um, the uh, received wisdom in the system, uh, and there can be, uh, and I have known this, uh, examples where officials have been put in a difficult position, where you know they have explicitly been um, s given a choice. You know, do you who do you work for? Do you work for the minister? Do you work for the permanent secretary? And if it's only the permanent secretary who is uh, 
uh, and only civil servants who are contributing <coughs> to the appraisal, then that's actually it's not very difficult to see where the self-interest, and it's to the enormous credit, actually, of most civil servants that they will ignore all of that. But it, it, it's crucially important. Not that the final word lies with the minister. That would be, that would be wrong. But actually, that there's a formal means for the minister to feed in um, views of the performance of individual civil servants and teams uh, so that, that the uh, assessment uh, of those uh, individuals and teams can reflect. Pick up the State Services Commission. Uh, it is um, you know, potentially quite a, a powerful entity, but uh, in our system that's balanced by fixed term contracts and I don't think any New Zealand government would go back to permanent tenure. The five year contracts um, are generally renewed, but not always. And secondly, there is provision there that if the relationship breaks down between the minister and the chief executive, uh, you know, gets to the point where the minister says, well, actually, that person can't come in my office, uh, then the State Services Commission has the responsibility for exiting, uh, solving the problem. And occasionally it does that. So, uh, and in the, <coughs> the legislation we're just about, we're going to be passing, we are going to give the head of state services a bit more power to reach into the second and third levels across departments. And at the moment they do the chief executive appointments, uh, which can be only vetoed by cabinet, which almost never happens. Um, but in addition to that, they'll be able to reach down to help uh, lubricate the leadership development process a bit more than, than we've had with um, you know, in departments being a bit too independent. But it is really important trade-off. The State Services Commission is, is, power in, is independent. Uh, they do have to be involved in protecting public servants, and they are quite actively. But they're not. Uh, the chief executive does not have permanent tenure, and I think that's not a bad. We've got not a bad balance there. Are you attracted by any elements of the State Services Commission, given you're moving into a different relationship? I don't know enough about it. It's one of the things I'd like. I want to understand much more. Um, and, um, but I think there are, there are lots of things where I think we just need to understand how it works better. What I think actually, uh, what I think I'm picking up, and we want to really understand this more, is that I think there's more clarity in the way the New Zealand system works than there is in ours. Um, and uh, that's, I think we need to understand that much more. That's one of the things we'll be doing in our briefing paper mm. next month. Um, time for two more questions. David. Uh, there's a mic coming for you. <coughs> and I, I want to explain to Deputy Prime Minister that um, David Normanton is our Civil Service Commissioner. Yes, David Normanton. Uh, Mr. English, I, I was fascinated by what you said. I just wanted to check something, though, which is you, you put up your five areas, sort of priority areas, and reducing crime was one, and I used to be a permanent secretary of the Home Office, so I'm interested in that one. And I think you said that ministers and the chief executive shared the objectives. Um, is there any attempt to separate what ministers are accountable for and what mm. the civil servants is That's accountable right. for? Because many accountability s systems um, in the public sector fail on this point, and I'm skeptical um, about how easy it is to say this is what politicians are responsible mm. for and this is what civil services responsible for, particularly in an area like reducing reoffending and reducing crime, where there are many and varied um, elements in reducing crime? Yeah. Uh, initially, no. Um, I mean, that, if you just take that example, uh, by the time we came to outline in detail um, the objectives, which are largely around reoffending rates, uh, we had already developed uh, very strong pipeline analysis and also collective governance. So the police commissioner, the head of justice who, run, who happened to run the courts as well as other things, and the head of the prison service and their ministers are from my point of view effectively the justice board <coughs> and now we meet quarterly. So we haven't tried to make it refined in a constitutional sense. Uh, they all know what they're trying to do. 
they've arrived in this collective from different perspectives and positions. Uh, it's got a good, healthy internal tension about it. Uh, what they all know is that <coughs> the minister knows they're going to be judged on whether they've achieved what they've published, and that happens to align pretty closely with the chief executives in each case. Uh, and that looks at the moment to be a fairly powerful alignment. Because I think once you start, as you go along, of course, we're going to argue over who did what and whether it made any difference. It's got the benefit in that case of starting on a wave of success anyway. Okay, they're already getting results. And as we formalise it, that, that helps. But again, we, it, we, if I just pull back a bit, we're trying to get this thing running on <coughs> judgment rather than compliance. So we're willing down the track to make the judgment. Did the police commissioner deliver? Now, you know, is there going to be uh, a whole big paper trail to prove it or not prove it? Well, there may or may not be, let's see. So I suppose we're getting around that issue by not focusing on it, just saying we all, <coughs> the way we develop the results, uh, the public environment is such that there's been really no debate over <coughs> the nature of what we're focusing on. It's been non-controversial and really no debate over the fact that the government is going to be accountable. Mm -hmm. And that alignment <coughs> is really, really important. And in some areas we've struggled to get that alignment uh, but we've got there, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Well, I, I rather agree with David, actually. I think it's, um, it's quite difficult to uh, separate out, in terms of kind of the public service del delivery outcomes, um, between what's, what's actually the consequence of the policy and what's the consequence of the way it's, it's implemented and delivered. Um, so I think, you, um, uh, I, I think our focus is much more on or in, in relation to permanent secretary objectives on the things which are plainly the responsibility of the permanent secretary to deliver, which will be things like um, um, on, on efficiency or major <coughs> projects um, and, and so on, where it is the responsibility to kind of take that and make it, um, and make it happen. But I think it is, you know, it is, it is um, uh, not, not that easy, and, and I think one of the things that I've heard, and I'd be really interested to, to pursue this and under, understand it better in, in the New Zealand system, is when the, the contract is in place with particular kind of objectives in the, uh, um, the chief executive's contract, of course, uh, in politics, as was famously said, you know, events happen and, and things change, um, and, and you know, you can't have a kind of fixed mm. five-year view. It's like sort of having a conversation with someone, and the first thing is, they don't say what they're meant to say, um, and events happen that you're not expecting to happen. And, uh, so I think it's 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 difficult to do this this perfectly. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to do it perfectly, but uh, and I, I agree with that. What <coughs> we've found is that if you allow the public service to drag you into a conversation about uncertainties, you'll agree on nothing, and nothing will happen, and you'll end up layering up program after program that is the minister's fad, the latest whim, the last expert from the US, and no one ever says, did it make a difference to someone? Yeah. Our Minister of Education has put a strong focus to this by uh, turning up at individual schools saying, you've got to get 47 more kids over the line. Right? It's a radically different approach than the DNA of the Ministry of Education which is to spend a decade improving the inputs and hoping that if you squeeze down hard enough from the top, something might pop out the bottom. So we have this little mantra, we know their names. And in a small country you do. <laughs> <laughs> right? We know the names of every young woman under the age of 18 who has a child, 2,600 of them, less than in our larger secondary schools. So there's not much point in rabbiting on about the uncertainties of sexual health education, right? Which has been an excuse for not engaging with these kids who have kids <laughs> and protecting them from violence and drug addiction and transience. So we've kind of junked strategies because they're excuses and uncertainties because 
they, are real, they can be real, but they can be excuses for saying, I spent 350 million and nothing is any different. Okay? That's the bit we're trying to fight, is the good intentions. If all the good intentions are, f you get away with it if you say this, I've got great intentions, I've got all this cash that turned up from people paying $150 a week in their, oh, in their PAYE, pay as you earn <coughs> tax. Uh, I don't, but, but there's so many uncertainties you can't judge whether I made any difference, just keep giving me the money. So hopefully we're swinging to one extreme and changing the system by saying, no, forget the uncertainties, these are the people you're responsible mm. for, this is what you've got to do, and we'll spend the next, you know, so show me you're making a difference. <coughs> that, that strikes uh, such a chord. I mean, the, um, uh, every local authority in Britain knows which of the families, uh, uh, by name, which cost most amounts of public yeah, money. Right. And in every local authority, it'll be somewhere between 50 and a few hundred. And they're the families with deeply entrenched intergenerational uh, <coughs> problems where we have for decades been ineffectively managing the symptoms of failure. And actually focusing on, um, generally not by state action, but by outside agencies, often with payment by results, to tackling the underlying problems of those named families. Mm. The human and social benefits are immense, as, as well as financial benefits. Well, thank you. Um, I think on that note, can I thank you both? It's absolutely fascinating, um, the compare and contrast. And um, Francis, you know your objective to get, get the growth rate up to 2 or 3%. No, get the debt. Uh, I mean, I'm slightly concerned you're satisfied with debt at 30%. You know, this is um, <laughs> um, this defeatism on that. And thank you very much indeed, Deputy Prime Minister. Absolutely absorbing account. Um, we're already doing l um, lots of work here on, on, on New Zealand, and we are going to take that forward. Um, and we're delighted to ha have you here, and I hope the rest of the trip goes very well indeed. And uh, if I can ask you to join me in thanking very much um, for <laughs> Thank you.